Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. When it comes to online multiplayer games, then dedicated high tick rate game servers offer the best possible experience as these game servers then run inside data centers which provide the required bandwidth and processing power. This is especially true for first person shooters like Battlefield, CSGO or Overwatch, just to name a few. A little bit different are 1v1 fighting games like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat or Skullgirls which do not use dedicated game servers. Their networking model and the way how they compensate network lag is actually quite interesting as I showed you in a video that I did about a year ago. You can find the link to that video in the description down below. So while I'm thinking about to revisit these games for an updated test, today's video is about the input and network delay of a different fighting game, Tekken 7. But first we must talk about a few networking basics which you need to know to understand the results of my tests. The reason why I always include this basic information on YouTube while my patrons can get a cut to the chase version on Vimeo is that on YouTube I must consider that these videos attract new viewers who have never seen such a netcode analysis before and so they might not know what I mean when I talk about tick rates, update rates or latency. In the past I did not include that basic information in every video. Instead I told my audience to please go to another video first which did provide that information. Sadly the comments on these videos and the YouTube analytics showed that no one followed this advice and as a result many people were either confused by my test results or they just misinterpreted them. So since I'm only doing these videos to help players to get a better understanding of networking in video games, I decided to always include this basic information when I test a new game or when it's been a long time since the last one. This is really the only way how I can ensure that someone who is new to this gets all the required information. But I didn't forget about those of you who already know the networking basics, so if you don't want to refresh your memory then you can skip that part of the video with the timecode link that you find in the description down below as well as in the pinned comment of this video. So let's dive into the networking basics then where we will start with the ping. Now what is that and where does the term come from? If you've seen the movie The Hunt for Red October then you might remember that scene where Sean Connery gave the order to use a single active sonar ping to re-verify their range to the target. The way this works is that your ship or submarine sends out an audio signal which then gets reflected by other objects in the water. This reflection is then received by microphones or hydrophones installed on your ship and that then allows you to determine the distance between you and that object by measuring the time between sending the audio signal and receiving the reflection. So when we talk about network connections then the ping between different devices is pretty much the same thing. Your device sends an ICMP echo request to another network device like a game server, which then sends an ICMP echo reply back to your device. When we then measure the time between sending the request and receiving the answer then we get the ping or round trip time of the data. So the ping tells us how long data has to travel through the copper and fiber optic cables to reach the other device. And the longer it takes data to reach its destination the greater the difference between what we see on our monitor and what the other players see on theirs, which is what we call lag. So when I jump then it takes some time until that information reaches the server and then the other client. With short distances and good routing between the players and the server this delay or lag is very low. However the bigger the distance between the clients and the server the longer it will take until these receive an update on what is happening. So the higher your ping the more you will lag which means that you have a bad experience. But it's not just the player with the high ping that suffers. Depending on how strong the lag compensation is in a game, the player with the high ping can also degrade the experience of players who have a low ping as these then either receive damage far behind cover or get shot before they can even see the player with the high ping. Developers have tried many different solutions to fix or at least mitigate this issue. Some have tried to use a region lock but that does not work as network congestion can cause your ping to go from a stable 20 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds at any time. So what can be done? The brute force solution is to disconnect players who have a ping high enough to cause that issue, however that will hurt your sales and communities which have members across the globe. DICE uses a quite interesting approach to attack this issue in Battlefield 1 which I want to show you now. Here we have a player with a ping of about 47 milliseconds, let's call him player 1. And then we got the shooter player 2 who has a ping of about 147 milliseconds. 
When player 2 now fires at player 1, then the client of player 2 will run the hit registration, which figures out that player 1 has been hit. The client of player 2 then sends this information to the server, which runs its own check to confirm the hit. When the server agrees, then it sends the hit confirmation back to player 2 and the damage data to player 1. This form of hit registration is called client-side server authoritative, because while the client does the hit registration, the server must still confirm the hit or no damage will be dealt. When I then slightly increase the ping of player 2 to about 157 milliseconds, then player 2 gets the aim lead indicator, which tells him that his ping to the server is too high. When player 2 now fires at player 1 again, then the hit will not register anymore, because the hit registration now changed from client-side server authoritative to fully server-side. But when player 2 then leads his shot, which means that he just has to fire a little bit earlier, then the shot registers again. This allows player 2 to still hit other players while not making the issue of receiving damage behind cover worse. So, once the ping of player 2 is higher than the configured threshold, his hit registration switches from client-side server authoritative to fully server-side, where the server won't compensate for the delay of player 2. This means that the only perspective that now matters is the one from the server and where he sees player 1 when it receives the information about the shot that player 2 fired. This is how DICE tries to mitigate the issue where players with low pings die far behind cover, while still allowing players from all over the world to come together and play their game. Now, what affects your ping to the game server or your lag in general? One factor that you already know of is the distance between you and the game server. However, it is not possible to determine your ping by taking a map and drawing a straight line between your home and the location where the server is hosted. Because the copper and fiber optic cables take a very different route, and the data that you send to the server has to pass through multiple routers before it reaches the server. So, when a router has to forward data, then it tries to use the best route. This means that when everything works as it should, then your data should take the shortest route to the game server. However, it can happen that a router either chooses a bad route, or that it has to choose a worse one when the better one is down. Such can then lead to quite big detours for your data, which can also result in much higher pings and an increased risk of packet loss, since your data might have to pass through many more routers then. So when you suddenly notice a much higher ping to your favorite server, then this could be caused by the routing. In this case, you will then have to call your internet service provider so that they can check their routing tables. If you want to get the issue fixed faster, then you can provide them with traceroute data for that server. For that, you open the command prompt, type in tracer and the IP of the game server that you have problems with. You will then get a list of all the hops between you and the game server, with the ping between you and each of these hops. However, please be aware that depending on its configuration, a hop might not reply to your ICMP echo request or with a greater delay. The same is true for game servers where many do not reply when you try to ping them from the command prompt. So the length of the route that connects the client to the server and the amount of hops between them affects how long it takes data to reach its destination. This means that the lag that we experience in a game can never be lower than the travel time of the data, unless we figure out a way to break the laws of physics to speed up the electrons or photons that are used for the communication between the client and the server. What adds an extra delay on top of the travel time of our data is how frequently we send and receive it. So when we send and receive 30 updates per second, then there is more time between updates than when we send and receive 60. So by sending and receiving more updates per second, you can decrease the additional delay that is added on top of the travel time of your data. But where is that data coming from? This is where the term tick or simulation rate comes into play, which is how many times per second the game processes and produces data. So when you have a tick or a simulation rate of 60, then this will cause less delay than when you use a tick rate of 30. A tick rate of 60 will also allow the server to send 60 updates per second. But not only the number of simulations that are done per second is important. It's also critical that the server finishes a tick as fast as possible, because at a tick rate of 60 Hz, it only has a processing window of 16.66 milliseconds, inside which it must finish a simulation step. So at the beginning of a new tick, the server starts to process the data it received and runs its simulations. After that, it then sends the results to the clients and then sleeps until the next tick happens. 
The faster the server finishes a tick, the earlier the clients will receive new data from the server, which reduces the delays between players and makes the hit registration feel more responsive. This is something that I showed in my Battlefield 4 tests where the netgraph displays the time the server needs to finish a tick. So when it comes to the server's performance, then it's imperative that it finishes a simulation step as fast as possible, or at least inside the processing window that is given by the tick rate. When it gets close to that limit or even fails to process a tick inside that time frame, then you will instantly notice this as that results in all sorts of strange gameplay issues like rubber banding, players teleporting, hits getting rejected, physics failing, etc. Now what kind of options do developers have when it comes to the network model? One solution is that you pay hosters to set up dedicated servers for your games in their data centers to which the players then connect to. This means that your game server is running on powerful hardware and the data center has enough bandwidth to handle all those players that connect to it. Also when the matchmaking makes sure that all players have more or less the same ping to the game server, then you can avoid that some players have an unfair advantage in some situations or give players with low pings a bad experience. The downside of dedicated servers is that if you don't have a game that builds around the idea of the community running these servers, then the publisher or studio has to pay for them and they are quite expensive. Another challenge is that if you release your game worldwide, then you must also make sure that all players who buy the game have access to low latency servers. If you do not do that, then you create many players with high pings and that is a problem for your entire community, not just the players who don't have servers near them. A different approach which many people falsely refer to as peer-to-peer -peer, is that you simply use the PC or console of one of the players to host the game, which means that he essentially becomes the server. With this solution the game studio does not have to pay for expensive dedicated servers. And it also allows players located in a remote region to play with their friends at relatively low latency. One of the many downsides that this network model is suffering from is that the player who is also the server gets an advantage, because he has zero lag. This causes that he will see you before you see him and he can fire at you before you can fire at him. Then we also have the problem that all players connect to the host through his consumer grade internet connection, when the worst case he could even use Wi-Fi. This frequently results in a lot of lag, packet loss, rubber banding and an unreliable hit registration. But the most infuriating part of such a client hosted match is the host migration, which is the process where the whole game pauses for several seconds while a different player is elected to replace the host that just left. Then we got the peer-to-peer -peer network model which you mostly see in 1v1 fighting games, but there are also a few other multiplayer games that have more than two players which use peer-to-peer. -peer. And since there are different variations of this network model, I will use For Honor as reference in this explanation. So in this network model we do not have a dedicated game server, nor is a client elected to host the match and run the simulation. However, we at least need a session host which takes care of invites and handshakes. That could be done by a dedicated server, or like in For Honor a client is used for that task, which is also why the game will pause for several seconds until a new session host has been elected should the previous one leave. Another downside is that because every client runs its own simulation, the responsiveness of the hit registration might also vary depending on the ping of the player you engage. So when you fight a player to which you have a ping of 5 milliseconds, then the hit registration might feel better than when you engage a player to which you have a ping of 148 milliseconds. Or players with a high ping make the hit registration less responsive in general as the clients keep their simulation in sync. Probably the biggest downside of this network model is security, as every game client knows and sees the WAN IP addresses of the other players. Besides that, there are a few other concerns that this peer-to-peer -peer network model has in common with client-hosted matches. Like the impact of underpowered hardware used by the players, as well as the players consume a great internet connection as all clients talk to each other to keep their simulation in sync. And anti-cheat is also always a very big concern in games that do not have an authoritative game server. So even though dedicated game servers do not magically provide 100% lag-free connections, I believe that they offer the best possible experience in online multiplayer games when you have more than two players in a match. Now, since we are talking about a fighting game here, we can't just look at the network delay. We must also test the input delay because, spoiler alert, there is a connection between the two. 
So to test the network delay I use a high speed camera, two PCs where each of them has its own fiber internet connection and a 144Hz gaming monitor on which the game runs at 60fps since that is the hard coded frame rate limit in pretty much all fighting games. To measure the delay between the players I point my high speed camera at the monitors and then have player 2 do a kick. Inside the high speed recording I then look for the frame where I see that player 2 does the kick on his monitor and then I count the frames until I see it on the monitor of player 1. Then for the input delay I use a 180Hz gaming monitor and the Xbox One controller which has a LED connected directly to one of its buttons. So this LED will turn on when I press that button. Inside the recorded high speed footage I then look for the frame where the LED turns on and then I count the frames until I see the action triggered by that input, which allows us to measure the delay between the button and the pixel. So let's have a look at my results from the input delay tests first. When you play against the AI or another player locally, then you get an average button to pixel delay of 60.11 milliseconds when you use the low graphics preset and have VSync disabled. When you enable VSync while still using the low graphics preset, then this leads to an input lag increase of about 50 milliseconds on average. When it comes to the other graphic presets and the render scale setting, then my tests show that as long as your system is able to maintain 60 FPS, none of them will increase the input delay further. Now compared to first person shooters like Overwatch, the delays that we see here are very high. However, there is a reason behind that which I will explain in a minute. But first, let's have a look at the delay that we get when we play online. So, as I said before, fighting games do not use a dedicated game server. Instead, the game clients communicate directly with each other. When we take a look at the network data that I captured with Wireshark during an online match, then we can see that the client sends and receives 60 updates per second. So we have update rates of 60 Hz, which match the frame rate limit of 60 FPS. Now, how long is the network delay between the players? And more importantly, how does Tekken 7 compensate network lag? In my test setup I have a ping of 1 millisecond between my clients as both internet connections come from the same internet service provider. So when we take a look at the high speed footage from one of the 20 tests at a ping of 1 millisecond, then we can see that the visual delay between the players is about 35 milliseconds on average. When I then increase the latency to 100 milliseconds, then you might expect that the visual delay increases by about 50 milliseconds, since the ping is the round trip time, and so the data of player 2 is delayed by 50 milliseconds. However, the high ping does not seem to have an effect on the visual delay. Once the ping between the two players reaches 150 milliseconds, the game will start to feel less smooth, as we are then crossing the threshold of how much latency the system can take. However, the visual delay is still not affected. So how is it possible that the visual delay is not affected by such a massive network delay increase? The reason behind this is the input delay of 110 milliseconds. When you press a button on your controller, then the game will only delay the action that you see on your monitor, while the information about that action is sent immediately to the other player. This is done to ensure that the perspectives of both players stay in sync, even at a ping of 100 milliseconds. So the intentionally high input delay of 110 milliseconds is used to compensate the network lag when you play online. But why is the same input delay present when you play locally or when you play against someone to whom you have a ping of just 20 milliseconds? The game could surely change the input delay of both players to match their current ping instead of using a high fixed value. But Tekken 7 does not do that, as you can see here in my input delay tests at a ping of 1 millisecond, 100 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds. The reason why Tekken 7 uses a fixed input delay is most likely to ensure that the game always feels the same, no matter if you play locally, online at 10 milliseconds, or online at 90 milliseconds ping. Such wouldn't work in a first person shooter, however in a fighting game, which is all about timing, I can see why the developers went with that design choice. So with this design the perspectives of both players differ by about 35 milliseconds no matter if they play at 1 millisecond or 100 milliseconds ping. Unless one of the players decides to disable VSync, then his perspective will be slightly ahead and so he sees the other player move before he can see the action that he triggered himself.
Which is probably why some fighting games force VSync to be on and don't allow the player to disable it. Now, how do you know the ping between you and the guy you are fighting against? Sadly, the game does not show you the exact ping value. Instead, you get a signal strength indicator where you have no idea if 3 out of 5 bars is any good or bad. So I ran a few tests to find out which ping ranges currently trigger the different states of this icon. With 30 milliseconds or less you get the blue indicator. At 31 to 80 milliseconds it turns green. Between 81 and 120 milliseconds it is yellow. Between 121 to 180 milliseconds it's orange. And with more than 181 milliseconds you get the red indicator. That said, once the ping between the players reaches 120 milliseconds, you will feel the first signs that the game does not run smooth anymore. And once it reaches 150 milliseconds, you probably want to leave the match because it's not an experience that you can enjoy. However, I hope that you enjoyed this delay analysis for Tekken 7. And if you would like to see an updated test of Street Fighter V, Mortal Kombat and Skullgirls, then just post a quick comment down below and let me know that this is something that I should work on. Now, you can surely imagine that a video like this one here takes a lot of time to make. From start to finish I spent about 28 hours on this video here. But besides the time that I spent on a single video, running this channel is also not exactly cheap. Not just because of the hardware and software I need to be able to do these tests, but also because I don't get review copies for the games I test. And so I must buy not one, but two copies whenever I test a new one. Which means that I spent nearly 100 euros on this video here, as I had to buy this game for this test. I did try to borrow games in the past, but that just never worked out. And in one case it also had a negative impact on the quality of the video. And at least I am not happy with that. So if you like this kind of niche content where I take a look at the inner workings of video games and show you how these affect your experience, then you can help me to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me on Patreon. The link is in the description below. Also if you want to stay up to date on what I'm currently working on, then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook. The links are also in the description of this video. And if you don't want to miss the next one, then you might want to subscribe to my channel and click on that bell icon below this video to receive a notification when I upload the next one. So if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.